Hello and welcome back to CST2120. So in this lecture I'm going to cover JavaScript arrays, JavaScript objects and JavaScript object notation, also known as JSON. So pretty straightforward, uh, you know, uh, structure. So if, obviously you can skip, you know, if you, it's quite a long lecture this, so you can obviously skip to the bit section that you need, because I'm going to start with the arrays, do a section on that, section on objects, and a section on JavaScript object notation. Okay, so, so far, um, in the last lecture, the introduction to JavaScript, um, we kind of talked about uh, strings, numbers, booleans, this kind of thing. These are called kind of primitive data types, yeah, they're sort of simple data types without sort of ma massive amounts of internal structure. So we've got strings, you know, we create strings like let x equals cat, um, and numbers, you know, floating point numbers, um, integers, that kind of stuff, sort of doubles, uh, you have in Java. Um, and then we've got booleans, you know, like let x equals true, that kind of stuff. These are sort of primitive data types, nice, simple, easy data types. And then the more complicated data types are kind of built on top of these more basic ones here. So in these, uh, in the previous lecture on uh, JavaScript, we used variables to store single values. So we had like let cat name equals Fred. That's just a single string that's been stored in inside the variable. Um, whereas we can use arrays um, to store multiple values together. We can kind of group sort of lots of different, lots of um, pieces of data together into a single variable, and, that, and that's what the array en enables us to do. So throughout this lecture, I'm going to be using the standards kind of square bracket syntax for creating arrays, um, but you can also use this kind of way new array with this sort of smooth braces, but quite frankly, why do all that typing when you just, can just use square braces? So square braces is a sort of standard way in which people define and manipulate arrays in JavaScript. So with arrays, you're storing lots of different values together. So JavaScript will handle each 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 uh, sort of element in the array can have a different type, and JavaScript can combine them all into a single array. So it's not going to automatically create an array all of a uniform type, um, as as you're kind of constrained to in Java. You might ginger, you know, this this at this point in the array, you might have a number, then we might have a boolean, then we might have a string, you know, and it can just combine them together like that. So to access elements in array, um, you, we use the in, what's called an index, because the array index er, elements are ordered. It's like you know a sort of list of elements, if you like. Um, and so there's an index number starts from zero. So you know something you just get used to when you do programming. It's like why does it begin with zero? How annoying is that? But it just does, and you just got to live with it. Um, so the first element of the array, even though it's the first element, is actually the zeroth index. Yeah. So this is 0, 1, 2, 3. Um, and so we can access the different elements um, using that index number. So if we do alert cat names 2, using the square braces to access uh, the element at position 2. Position 2 in this case is here, um, because the uh, index is start at 0. So it's the third element, but we're using 2 to access it with the index here of 2 because um, that's just how arrays work, you know. So here, and I think there's one or two other programming languages. You, you actually find it more confusing when, you know, someone introduced a programming language that has, like, you know, uses, um, you know, starts at one, because you just get so used to them starting at zero that it just becomes the norm. But anyway, so cat names two um, is referring to that position in the array, so we're getting Tom being alerted there, yeah. So um, we can sort of create an array, um, and we can also use the array index to change the value in array, yeah? So here we got cat names, here's our array here, and if we want to change, um, this is position index two, right? Tom, Tom the cat. And if we want to change Tom's name to Marmalade, maybe he's gone to a new home or something like that, um, then we do cat names two equals Marmalade. So that'll copy the string here to this position in the array. So again, if we uh, alert cat names two, we're getting Marmalade instead of instead of Tom. So hopefully this is fairly obvious stuff, yeah? Now arrays have this very handy property called length, which returns the length of an array, um, which is how many elements are in it, yeah? So in this case we've got four elements, so if we do alert cat names dot length, um, then this will, you know, show us a, f a four, yeah? Because that's the number of elements in the array. So the length is always one more than the highest index. So the highest index, this index here is three, so the length is four. So I thought it'd be fun to, uh, you know, show you arrays sort of in practice, so to speak. And so a nice little example of this is, is this kind of baby name generator. 
So, you know, we've all had this problem, right? You know, we come back from the hospital with, you know, five quintuplets or something like that. You've got these babies lying around, you know, what are you going to name them, right? And what, what, a, what, a, what a hassle, yeah? Or maybe your cat's just had kittens, has nine different kittens. You know, you, you want to give those kittens names, right? Not just numbers. It's a bit, you know, harsh to call your cats by number. Um, so you, you need to find some names, yeah? And, but you're also maybe the kind of person who likes an original name rather than just, you know, Bob, Tony, Sue, this kind of stuff, yeah? Um, so if you want an original name, you know, one way to do that is to write a little bit of JavaScript that's, you know, generates names for you. So this is what this is here, yeah? So this is a baby name generator. Um, so it's not a perfect baby name generator because if you want something really original, you generate an original name and then check on the internet to see if it exists already. But that's sort of whole web scraping thing sort of out of scope here, yeah? So let's just do a little demo and then we can go into how it works and use it to illustrate how arrays work, yeah? So let's... Uh find where we are. Uh, yep, here we are. Yep. So what it does, it says naming your baby is Jope in this case, uh, or Zemo. So each time we refresh it, it's generating a new random name for the baby. Or puppies, right? I'm not, you know, against naming dogs using the system. Um, or Temo, Soksu, Wine, Jape. So some of these names exist already. We just saw Wine come up, right? Uh, some of these, you know, no doubt exists in, you know, various languages. Um, but what it's doing here, it's not following any fancy rules. Um, it's generating a consonant and capitalizing it. Then it's randomly generating a vowel, then another non-capitalized consonant, and then another vowel. So it's consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel, and it's just generating these randomly, yeah, to, to, and putting them together to form the name of the baby, yeah? Okay. So let's just go through how it works, and hopefully that'll give you, you know, a little bit more of a feel for how arrays work, which is really what, what's important here, yeah? So starting off, we've got two arrays, yeah? So we separate, we've got separate arrays for vowels and consonants because otherwise we'd end up with weird, weird and unpronounceable baby names, yeah? So in English, if you've got a, a consonant, a vowel, consonant, vowel, um, then that's fairly easy to say. That's how we end up with names like, you know, Goo, Kiwi, this kind of stuff, yeah? Or wine, for that matter. Um, so what we want to do is we want to pick a consonant from this array, then we want to pick a vowel from this array, then another random consonant from here, another random vowel, and then we just stitch them together to form the baby's name. That's, so that's, that's what we're using the erase for here. So we need to, to be able to select these vowels and consonants, we need to generate a random number between zero and the maximum index of the array. So this is maximum index of this array is one, two, three, four, five. There's five consonants, right? So we want to generate an, a vowel index, in this case here, between naught and uh, four, right? Because numbers go from naught to four for the array. So what we're going to use for that um, are these maths uh, functions, a couple of JavaScript maths functions, which I thought would be worth kind of explaining anyway, because they're useful in many, many things. And when you come to write your game, um, you'll find these JavaScript math functions very useful, yeah? So JavaScript uh, in the browser, I'm not so certain about Node, but certainly within the browser, um, there's a maths object that allows you to perform mathematical tasks. So we've got this uh, math.random function, random function here that generates a random number between one north and one, and then math.floor will round a number downwards to the nearest integer. So with a couple of extra bits on top of that, we can use these functions um, to generate a random number within a certain range. You know, if we want the number between you know naught and ten, you know we multiply whatever comes out of here by ten, and then use math.floor um, to round it down. Or we, well, that, that would, yeah, we have to do it between 0 and 0. Anyway, never mind. Let's just, let's just go into it, yeah? So I'm just going to demo this for you um, because I think it's, uh, it's useful and it'll explain how the baby name generator works, yeah? So first, uh, let's just do a bit of console logging, yeah? Um, so, oh, yeah, one minute. Uh, about math.random. Okay, so let's just see what math.random does by itself. And it's easier sort of seeing random numbers if we, put, if we do several of them, so... I keep doing Java stuff, right? Let i equals no, uh, i is less than, just say, to generate 10 random numbers, uh, i plus plus. Okay, so, so what this is going to do is generate, log out 10 random numbers generated using math.random. So save that, and because I've got go live working, um, then every time I save it in Visual Studio, it's automatically refreshing it. So I hope you've got this kind of workspace, work sort of flow we're working by now, because it makes life much, much easier. So as you can see, Math uh, math.random generates a number between naught and one, yeah? So here are the various numbers here, but this is, first problem with this is, obviously, even if we round them up or round them, we're gonna get a number, we're either gonna get a one or a zero, which isn't what we need. We need a number within a certain range um, if we wanna be able to select a random index from an array. 
So what we'll start with here, I'll just define a variable here, let uh, max, let's, let, let's say we say want an array length equals, let's say we want to generate, we've got an array that's length 8 here. So to get the numbers so that they can actually be useful indexes for our array, we need to multiply them by the array length, yeah? Okay, so now let's see what that looks like. Um, so here we go. So, so this looks, this is looking better now, right? So we've got, you know, 7, 5, blah, 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 but we've also got this bunch of junk here. And if we try and use that as our array index, it's not going to work. So we need to round them. Now we could use the math has a round function that will round it up or round it down. But here, um, we always want the number to be less than this array length, yeah? So we've, if we have, if we don't, if we just round it, um, then what we're going to do is end up, sometimes it's going to be like 7.6, it's going to round it up to 8, and then we're going to get an out of bounds error on our array, yeah? So what we can do instead is we can do math.floor, yeah? Which will just, math.floor just chops off all the binary, all the stuff after the decimal point. So that's kind of what we want to do here. Um, so now if we do math.floor, here we have, you know, 1, 0, 5, 0, blah, blah, blah. If we refresh it, we get a different bunch of numbers, up to 7, refresh it again. The numbers are always less than less than 8, so the maximum is 7, and sometimes we're going to get zeros as well, yeah? So yeah, there's some zeros, yeah? So this is a nice way in which we can select a random index from an array using math.floor, array length times math.random. So that's what we're doing here. We're generating random indexes for the arrays. <coughs> And then generating the baby name is, is a very simple once we've done that. All we have to do is access the consonants at, that, at the random consonant index and the vowels. We get each of the random uh, letters, put them together, and then display them to the user. Now, JavaScript arrays are dynamic. They're, so, they're more, so if you're used to Java, um, then in Java, arrays are kind of fixed. You have to say, well, I want an array that's 10 elements long and, and you, that can never be changed. You have to create a new array and copy everything if you change it. But with Java, you also have uh, lists and you know all kinds of other stuff and vectors. Um, but lists are kind of handy, right? But So with Java lists, you can add stuff, delete stuff. They're kind of dynamic. You don't have to say, I want a list that's 100 elements long. <coughs> so here's an example. So here we're creating an empty array, just with square brackets. And we use push um, to add elements to the array. So here I'm pushing the elements on dynamically. Um, and so at the end of the day, when I output the array, um, I'm getting my, my list, my, the contents of the array. So this is a very handy feature of arrays, yeah? We might also want to remove elements from array. Um, so you can use delete, but what delete will do, it'll leave the array with the same sort of number of elements, but it'll just... Uh, delete the value at the specified point in the array, yeah? Which isn't very handy most of the time. So most of the time you want to be able to chop out a bit of the array and have the other elements sort of shuffle down so that the, so that the array remains full and all has meaningful values. So suppose you've got an array at positions 1 and 2, we've got orange and lemon, we want to remove the orange and lemon from the array. So we do fruits.splice um, which will remove all the elements starting at one and finishing at two. If I did splice one one, that would just delete the orange. Yeah. So the so after the splice operation, we've still got a full array, so to speak. There's no spaces in it, um, but now we're missing the orange and the lemon entries. So let's just have a little example. Okay. So let's do, do a dynamic array then. Yeah. So uh, well, that's just you know let's uh, let's number. So use the same code, make a lot easier. Number array equals, <coughs> so I've got an empty array. Then I'm going to add for each. Let's keep that actually, because that might be useful. Let's save a bit of the typing later, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, console, right, okay. So, so, so good. this is just the output, yeah. So I plus... Uh, data. So the second bit I'm doing first, just because it's easier. Yeah. So this second bit here, this is outputting display array. Yeah. <coughs> so that's displaying the contents of the array because I'm going to fill the array with ten ten things. So that's fine. And then we can do. It's so got a number array here. So do. Uh, Array dot push, 
uh, number, and then we just can add add number plus uh, i plus you know uh, i times a hundred or something. Yeah. So I'm just going to fill the array with a string in this case, um, saying no. Well, uh, do I want string? No, let's let's, put, let's just use numbers here. Yeah? Um, so we're going to put into the array. I'm going to put i times a hundred. Yeah. Um, and so it'll be like, first entry will be naught, second entry will be 100, and so on and so forth. And then we're going to log out the data in the array, yeah? So let's just check that that works, yeah? So the first element, naught, zero, naught, 100, da, da, da. So the data in the array is naught, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 900, yeah? Now, what we could do is we could delete, use delete to remove one element of the array. But as I said, this delete's not great. Uh, so let's say delete number array uh, four or something, yeah, so delete 300 or something like that, uh, or 500, I get still get confused about that, so if we delete one element in the array, we get, uh, yeah, 400, uh, the data is undefined, yeah, um, and it's undefined because it's not actually removing the element, it's just removing the data associated with the element, so that's not so good, well, instead, um, we can use the splice tool, splice method, uh, splice and if we want to remove the same element, so we, we move from starting at index 4 until index 4, yeah? So splice um, will give us uh, better, yeah? In this case, we've got 100, 200, 300. Oh, wait a minute, I've done something wrong here. Uh, what have I done here? Uh, maybe... Yeah, that's it, right, okay, so I messed up with splice, yeah? So splice... Starting at point four, it does, you know, one index. Yeah, and if I did splice three, I presume it's going to remove three, is it? Um, 300, 400, 500. Don't know why the 789 is undefined. I'm missing something here. Uh, four. So if we do splice one, one. Okay, so that's remove 100, right? And also the last one. Why is it doing that? Ah, yeah, I know why. <laughs> okay, I'm being stupid here, yeah? So instead of going i to 10, um, because it's splicing, is shortening the array. That's a mistake I'm making here. So number array dot length. That's, that's the problem I got, yeah? So it's, I was actually right. So if I want to remove four and four, um, that's fine, that's a stupid mistake I was making, so now it's working fine, yeah? So it's removing point 0.400, um, and it's removing four points after 400, so 400, 500, 600, 700. Uh, so this is the number of points, not the uh, not the range, actually. So if we 4, 1, remove just 400, and if I do 4, well, probably 4, 0, I don't know what that'll do, let's see. Uh, 4, 0 does nothing, yeah? So splice is actually not, I was mistaken, it's not removing the... It's not going from four to six or something like that. It's removing the number of elements starting at four. So if we do four one, it removes um, element 400 and just removes one element starting at index four, yeah? So that's clear now. We've built the number array. We've spliced out index four here using four one here, and then we displayed it again. And the mistake I made um, was that I had a fixed number here. so but I was reducing the array with the splice operation, so that's why I was getting all these weird undefines, yeah? Okay. <coughs> right, so, um, off, having an array is all very nice, but often you want to work through all the elements in the array to display them or do something with them, yeah? So the sort of classic way of doing this uh, is just using a for loop, as I've just shown you. We just do for let i equals null, i is less than fruits.length, i plus plus, and then you just access the data in the, uh, for each of the points um, using fruits i, whatever what the array, the array is called. You can also iter iterate over an array using for each. Um, and this is, and with for each, you're specifying a function that's executed on each array element. So you have a function, you pass in the data from the array element, the value associated with it at that point in the array to the function and then you can do something with it. So this isn't good for changing the array, but it's very good for doing things with the data in the array um, that doesn't involve changing the array. Now different ways in which you can use the function, you can either call a function that's defined elsewhere in the code, 
um, or you can use an anonymous function um, defined using the function keyword or arrow notation. So I'll explain both of these options. So this is the for each with function keyword, so in this case we're doing fruits for each and we're just using the standard way of defining a function only without the function name. Um, so, so what this will do is it'll call a function without a name, um, pass in element as an argument to that function, and then you can do stuff with that argument, you know, like output it, all this kind of stuff, yeah? <coughs> so more modern versions of JavaScript, um, I think at least since ES6, um, you can use arrow notation um, to define functions, and actually that's better. So this is quite a complicated keyword in JavaScript, but sometimes, um, you know, you, you have to do some rather hacky stuff to get around problems with this um, if you use the, the sort of standard way of defining functions with a function keyword. So this, the lambda notation, the arrow function stuff, arrow way of defining a function is actually better, so I recommend that you stick to that whenever you're defining anonymous functions, unless you've got a very good reason for using the function keyword. So a single argument arrow function is also more elegant, right? Less typing. So you have like the argument here, and then the arrow notation, the equals, and then the greater than sign, and then the curly brackets with the code inside, yeah? If you've got multiple arguments, you put smooth braces around it, and you have the two arguments there separated by the comma, and then again, this, the arrow notation like that. Yeah, so it looks a bit like that. So instead of for each um, with a function, you just have the element, which is the name of the argument, um, and then the arrow, and then the thing, and then we can output the element like that. Okay, so... <coughs> so I've already shown you how to display the array using the standard way and how I messed it up. So you use num i's less than number a dot length, and you don't need to know the length, and then you just output the output it like that. So let's uh, let's do the same thing using for each. So so if we do number array for each, right? So let's um, let's try this um, this try an external function first, yeah, which which is perfectly valid for doing this kind of stuff. Uh, times uh, 10 or something, yeah? Uh, number, yeah? So what this will do, it will output um, uh, number times 10 is plus, um, yeah, so it'll output the number times 10. It's not really an amazing function. But what I can do then is call my number array for each, uh, and then be elements. Uh, now if we use, oh yeah, then we can actually just name the function, yeah? Instead of creating an anonymous function, we can just name the function we want to call. If we save that, um, and hopefully it'll work, uh, times 10, I've got spelt it wrong, yeah? Uh, it's times 10, times 10, yeah? Okay, it's not defined. So now, uh, sort of, so the first element in the array, what's this array full of? Um, so the array is i times 100, so now it should be with 1,000, that's right. So let's make it, to make it clearer, let's, uh, let's stick, stick with it, yeah. So, so the numbers, um, times 10, 0 times 10 is 0, 100 times 10 is 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 500. So it's outputting, so I'm naming a function, the important thing here is I'm naming this function here explicitly, and that function is defined elsewhere in the code. Now, what we could do instead and most of the time you're going to do this is create an anonymous function. You can do that with a function keyword. We could have elements. Um, and do it like that. That's the sort of, and this would work just as well. You we can put the code in there. In this case, let's make it number times 11. Just make it different. So this case, it's going to multi output the number times 11, uh, you know, for each of the elements in the array. I've messed up again, number's not defined. Uh, okay, um, Okay. so that's 11 times the each each of the n numbers in the array. Um, but much better way of doing this is using lambda functions or arrow functions, um, in which case, since there's only one argument, we just have, we can just put the argument by itself, and then we just use the equals greater than sign, the arrow sign, and then that points to this function, and then this function then will be executed for each of the elements. So the first point in the array, it'll call it with the element equals zero, then it'll be element equals 100, and so on and so forth, yeah? And then, so that should, that works fine, right? Okay. Right, so that's arrays. 
you know, there are other features of arrays, um, but I don't want to like overload you with this stuff. So I hope that's given you enough of an idea about how arrays work so you can, you know, incorporate them into your, into your own code in sort of sensible ways. Next thing I want to talk about is objects. So you're going to use JavaScript objects a lot, yeah? So they're a way of combining both data and functions together into a single structure. So if you're familiar with C++, you have this kind of idea of a struct, which is more of a data structure, doesn't have the functions, or a hash map, again, in Java, many programming languages, again, more of a data structure, but it's kind of got the same idea, except in JavaScript, functions are a particular type of data, so that's why you can just stick functions into objects in this sort of slightly arbitrary way, yeah? And so once you've got objects, then you can start to use JavaScript objects in an object-oriented way. And as I explain later, um, you know, JavaScript objects are kind of object-oriented, but they're also kind of not, and they have, whereas you can actually, in more modern versions of JavaScript, you've got classes, which will let you use JavaScript in a much more object-oriented way. So if you want to do sort of object-oriented programming JavaScript, you should be using classes, not just sort of raw sort of basic objects. Yeah, but basic objects have many, many uses, um, so it's well worth getting to use them to know how they work because you're going to be using them all the time. You know, classes you will use, but objects more probably. So really objects are just data structures, yeah? So they used to consist of one or more name value pairs and you create an object in this way, yeah? So you have like a, you know, obviously this the, the kind of let, you know, declaring a variable. In this case, it's, it's a pointer in a way, it points to a data structure in memory. And this is important um, when it comes to passing objects into functions and stuff, but just, uh, it's, it's treated, it's kind of like a variable, yeah? And it points to, um, obviously you've got the curly brackets to define objects, whereas arrays are defined using square brackets. Then inside the object, um, you have a bunch of keys, name, age, and alive are keys, and each key is associated with a value. And you use these uh, double, these uh, colons, um, to define, uh, the, to connect the key to the value, yeah? So you have the, the key, colon, and then the value, and the value could be a string, a number, or any kind of a JavaScript data type, yeah? And then the key value pairs are separated by commas. So that's all a JavaScript object is. So we can define it in the way I just explained, and then to access the properties of the object, um, we can just follow the object name with a dot and add the property name. So for example here, uh, I'm accessing person, has this property uh, name, this key name. So if I do person.name, then that lets me output John in this case, because that's inside the object there, yeah? So you just dot and then the property, yeah? a bit like, again, similar to Java, but without any access restrictions. Um, and I can use the dot notation to change the properties in objects. So, so initially the person's age is set to 50. If I do person.age equals 38, then it'll assign 38 um, to, to the age inside the person object. Yeah, so if I output it, then I, I see that it's 38 rather than 50. So we can also uh, dynamically add properties to an object. The object's not fixed at runtime. Um, you can just keep adding stuff into it. And again, this makes it more like a hash map than a Java object, yeah? So we've got person, we can just create an empty object using the curly braces. And then we do person.name equals John, person.age equals 50, person.alive equals true. We can just add these properties dynamically rather than just having them all fixed at the beginning. So curly braces and then we add the stuff, yeah? You can also use um, square brackets to access properties in an object. Um, so you put the property in quotation mark, um, otherwise JavaScript's gonna look for a variable with a property name, yeah? And I'll try and explain this in the demo. It's, so it, it might look, you know, kind of pointless, right? Because you've got an extra, you know, uh, instead of one dot, you've got, you know, two quota quotation marks and two square brackets. So most of the time, you're not gonna bother using this kind of notation. You will use this kind of notation where you don't know which property you want to access from the object, um, and you might be getting that dynamically from a web page or something like that. So this is useful, but you won't be using it all the time. Okay, so let's uh, let's do a little demo, yeah? Okay, so we can get rid of that. Uh, so let's, uh, not feeling wildly imaginative today. So, uh, Bob, so let's create a cat called Bob, uh, name, uh, Bob, um, so age, uh, let's say 10, so respectable age for cats, and height in centimeters, let's say, uh, cats are maybe 40 centimeters, not great on cat heights, but anyway, there we got Bob, yeah? So created a simple JavaScript object, I could put any kind of stuff in there, yeah, and I'll talk about more complicated objects in it a little bit later. So now, um, if we want to do, cons we can do console.log, um, 
Bob uh, dot name, for example, I can access the properties of Bob like that, yeah. And if we go back, go over to here, we can see there's Bob's name. The console will also let me log just the object itself. Um, so here we've got the, it'll, it'll show the entire object, which is kind of handy. If with more complicated objects, it probably won't do that. You might have to stringify it and then, and then log it, as I'll explain later. Um, now what else? Oh yeah, okay, so we might also want to access properties of Bob. So if you do age, for example, we can use the square bracket notation. So here, for example, as age is 10, it's worked perfectly fine, but, may, but um, it will not work if we do that, yeah? It gives, um, age is not defined because it's treating age here as a variable and it's, and it's not defined, so it can't, can't look for it. But we might use a, might, might have a situation where we have let key equal age, let's say, um, and then we might want to use them because key is defined. Um, we can access the the property of Bob um, that corresponds to the value of key, which in this case is age. Yeah. So we save that. We got uh, ten right, and then you know maybe someone on the web page or something is saying, well, tell me something else about Bob. Tell me his height. Yeah. So we change that there. Then we can extract the height. Yeah. So in this kind of case where we have a variable holding which key we're trying to access then the square bracket notation, it will work. Yeah, whereas if we do bob.key, it's gonna look for a property of key inside bob and it's almost something we undefined. Yeah, it's undefined. So that's where the square bracket notation comes in handy. Okay, yep, I think that's covered that. So this is uh, just something you have to learn and remember really. So um, when we, in the lecture on introduction to JavaScript, I talked about passing um, when we call a function, we, we have, you know, the arguments of the function, the parameters of the function, and we copy stuff into them. When we call, when we're using primitive data types, um, what we're passing in is kind of copied into the function, but with objects um, and arrays, um, you're actually passing a reference, a pointer to the actual object in array. So it's probably easy to explain this in memory, yeah? It, so probably, ex I'll use an example to explain this, yeah? Okay, so this is the example we had before, yeah? So, from the, from the lecture on introducing JavaScript. So we've got a function, increase number, okay? Um, have the um, arguments of the function, or the sort of parameter of the function, um, is number, okay? So, and then what happens is it increases number within the function, but it's, but it's not increasing uh, my number here, because what happens when we call it, my number is copied into number, the value of my number, which in this case seven is copied into number, the number acts as a sort of a variable with local scope, with a scope within the function. So it increases number, but it's, but it's only increasing a, a copy, if you like, of my number. It's not increasing my number itself. So inside the function, the number has increased, right? The increased number is eight. But outside the function, um, my number hasn't increased at all. It's still at seven. And that's because my number, the value of my num, the variable, was copied into number, not my number itself, yeah? But the situation is very different um, with objects and arrays. So instead of the, a copy of the value of the variable being passed into the function, um, the function can actually change the object or array. So, you know, expressed by saying whatever happens in the function does not stay within the function. Um, and it's called pass by reference. So uh, here's a little example. So, so here, with an object, John is uh, pointing to a data structure in memory. So this is kind of to make everything more efficient, I guess. So in this case, when we cr when we do let John equals all this stuff, you know, somewhere in the RAM, it's creating that object with all that kind of stuff in it, yeah? And so John, in this case, is pointing to that data structure in, in the memory, yeah? And we could also create another copy of that. We could also create other pointers that point to that same data structure, yeah? If we said let John equals Julie or something like that, yeah? So if we say, uh, so then if we check to see, you know, is John alive, does John dot alive, then this is true right at the beginning. But then if we call the function here, um, instead of copying all of this into the function, into person, and then doing something independently of John to this person, instead all it's doing is it's person and John are both pointing to the same data structure in memory. So if we do person dot alive equals false, <coughs> it's actually changing John in a way that it wasn't in the previous example. So now, um, after we've called the function, the alive status is set to false in John um, because it's changed the actual object itself. The function's changed the object itself. 
Okay, so actually I'm going to do a little demo of that, yeah? So, so let's just keep that the same. So, so let's do change function change name. Um, uh, okay. Uh, this is a cat, isn't it? Uh, cat, new name. So I can actually have functions that do things to the objects, yeah? So let's just do log bob, make our lives easier. So let's just do log bob, and then we'll um, do change name bob uh, tony or something. Um, okay, and then we'll do copy, copy that, um, and then change name Okay, so cat.name equals new name. Um, so we've got logging Bob, changing Bob's name. And so in this case, it's gonna pass Bob, it'll just, cat will, will just become another pointer to Bob. They'll be dealing with the same data structure. Um, so in theory, um, let's just check. Uh, yeah, so this is the Bob object before changing the name. And this is the same, the same object um, but with with changes made by the function, yeah? And just to illustrate this again, let me see if I can come up with a nice, a better example. So if we do with with objects, right? So let's just do let uh, var1 equals uh, one, two, three, four, let's say. Let var2 equals uh, five, six, seven, eight, let's say, yeah? Um, so we've got two variables, and we say var1, uh, let's just think, uh, right, so let's, let's do var1 let's equals var, let's create, let's create a new variable, var2 equals var1, yeah? So in this case, what's going to happen, because it's a simple primitive data type, it's just going to copy 1, 2, 3, 4 into var2. So if we do console log var1, var1 plus var2, two. okay, so I think you'll see the point of this in a second. Yeah, so if we log both var1 and var2, var1 and var2 have got the same value, yeah? Now, if we say uh, var2 or var1 equals 5, 6, 7, 8, okay, and then do the same logging, yeah? Uh, okay, so now um, they've got different values, yeah? var1 is 5, 6, 7, 8, and var2 is 1, 2, 3, 4, because they, they're not linked in any way. They're just copying the value of var2 into var1, and these are completely separate and independent variables, yeah? Now let's change this for an object, yeah? Um, and let's say uh, number, this is really boring code, but anyway, so var1 equals that, okay? And then var2, var1, okay, so, var one's an object. Now var2 because var1 is not going to create an independent copy of this. It's going to be pointing to the same data structure in memory. So then if I do var2 dot number, um, it's also going to change var1, at least in theory. Um, so ah, I told you I might my problems there, so hold on. Um, once objects get more complicated, why is it not logging that? Yeah. Oh yeah, because I'm adding it to strings, yeah. Uh, let's just log them separately. I'll just I'll just stringify actually. Sorry, this is the next bit of the lecture, but just save save time. Yeah, uh, val one and a stringify. I can add it to a string. Uh, that, that's the problem here. Okay, um, I'll explain this later. Yeah, don't worry about it. Um, so let's just log these twice. Okay. So I'm just logging it in a slightly more fancy way to get this problem. Yeah, so, so here, because they're both pointing to the same object, um, 
when I modify one object, in this case I set var2.number, it's changing both objects together. So before, var1 and var2 have got 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. Now I've only changed var2, but because it's just a pointer, um, it's changing both objects at the same time, yeah? So that's, that's the point I'm trying to make, and the same thing happens when we do change cat name and all that kind of stuff. Okay, well hopefully that's uh, illustrative rather than confusing. Okay, now what I want to say here um, is that objects themselves can be very complicated in the sense you can have objects within objects, uh, arrays within objects, arrays of objects, and so on and so forth. And what you'll find as you do more and more web development is that a lot of your time will be spent trying to unpick and understand, you know, these complicated J J uh, JavaScript objects, yeah? So a lot of, you know, my students in their third year, you know, spend, you know, because you're dealing with web services with these very complicated structures, you know, spend a bit of time trying to figure out how this works and you'll get better at this over time, yeah? So just give you some examples. Here we've got an array of objects. So there's an array, square brackets, and then we've got an array of objects here. Um, and we can have objects within objects. So here we've got house is a sort of pointing to an object. Inside that object, we've got two other objects. Inside these other objects, we've got another four objects. Yes, yeah? so it's objects within objects within objects in this case. And it just goes on and on, yeah? We can also have arrays within objects. So in this case, uh, team contains uh, key player names pointing to an array. So really, you can mix these things up in any old way you like, yeah? And then to access the the array, we do team.playerNames, and then because it's an array, we then use the square brackets to access the sec the element with the index 2 in the array, yeah? Which is <coughs> the third player in the team in this case. All right, so that's um, just explaining that objects can get complicated, I guess. So, that, so I've just, um, so far, I've been just been talking about JavaScript objects as a way of storing data, which they used for a lot. JavaScript objects can also contain functions because, as I'll stress in the advanced JavaScript lecture, functions are just another data type in JavaScript, in JavaScript so obviously you can have uh, a key pointing to a function, yeah? Now, when a function's inside an object, it's called a method, um, in proper object or in pro programming at least, and a collection of properties and methods used in many programming languages to model objects, yeah? So, JavaScript object or in pro JavaScript has objects which are kind of like some intermediate ground between, you know, uh, some something a bit close, a bit like object-oriented programming, but not quite, because it doesn't have constructors, and you can't do inheritance, so, and even the, and you can't even control the public or private properties. So JavaScript objects are a bit like object-oriented programming, but JavaScript classes are much more like a proper object-oriented programming. So if you want to do proper object-oriented programming, do use classes um, rather than objects. Objects are kind of somewhere in between. So let's see an object with a function, just to explain this then, yeah. So we've got here, we've got a key um, that instead of pointing to a string or a number or something like that, is pointing to a function instead, yeah. And so to call that function, I just do person dot the um, the variable, the the key. And because I want to call the function, I have to use the, the braces uh, notation to actually call the function to treat it as a function to be called rather than just a piece of data, yeah. Now, a function that's inside an object, so in this case, this is inside an object, um, can access other properties of the object. And this is where the this keyword, which is you're probably familiar with with Java to some extent, yeah? So here's my little example. So inside uh, the object John and the object Julie, we've got a key name which has the value John and the value Julie. Now, inside the function, if I want to access, um, you know, the name or something like that, then I do this.name, and then that'll give me access to uh, John in this case, or Julie in this case. So when I do say hello, David, it's saying hello, David. That's this bit here, interlocutor, and passing that in as argument to the function. And then I am John, um, because I'm using this dot name to access uh, the name property inside John, which the function's embedded in. Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, let's do some objects of the functions. Okay. So. Okay. So. Stick with cats, yeah, cat equal, uh, all right, to claim my cat as a name, you know, ginger or something. Um, okay, and then uh, say, say meow, and this is a function now. So we're not using lambda here, we're using standard, uh, uh, using the function keyword. Uh, okay, and then owner, and then we'll say console log, uh, 
Meow, whatever. Meow. Plus owner, let's say. I mean, this isn't terribly exciting. Plus, you know, I am. And then plus, ah, there we go. This dot name, yeah. Okay, so this dot name is accessing name inside there. So we've got the cat declared already. So as I said, with proper objects, you get constructors, which makes everything easier. Here, you just have to create the objects each time, pretty much. And then we can do cat dot say me out, yeah. And probably get, let's just try it without the braces and see what it does here. Yeah? It probably does nothing. Uh, it does nothing, yeah. We could probably console log it even. Okay, so if we, did, if we miss the braces, yeah, firstly it doesn't work, um, but it's then logging it as, because it's a functions are a type of data, type of variable, if you like, it's kind of logging the function itself, yeah? It's not calling the function, it's just treating it as a kind of data type, yeah? So instead, um, obviously we want to call the function, so then we apply the braces to it and pass in an argument, in this case, you know, David, let's say, yeah? So we do cat.sayMeow, it's calling that function there, inside the object and it can access the other properties of the object using this, yeah? So in this case, with a bit of luck, meow, help David, I am ginger, kind of thing, yep. Yeah? Good stuff, yep. Yeah? And that's the use of this. So, um, in general, um, object-oriented programming is great, I think. Um, very helpful to represent real-world objects with JavaScript objects, yeah? You can have properties representing the properties of objects, add functions, changing the objects in appropriate ways, yeah? This is going to be super useful in your coursework. So you might have a card game that has objects representing cards in the pack. Park, pack could have a function that deals cards out, all this kind of stuff, yeah? So I love object-oriented programming, and it's great for things like games or anything really where you're representing things that loosely correspond to an object. Um, so as I explained, object-oriented JavaScript is, 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 is really implemented with classes where you can, have, you can create a single class and then you can create instances of that class um, rather than, um, which then you can sort of you know, manipulate and call, call functions and all that kind of stuff, yeah? With the sort of objects, just straight objects, they have methods in, but if I want to create two, two different people in this case, I have to kind of copy and paste the code for John and Julie and copy and paste the function code and all the rest of it. So if I had a card pack done this way, it'd be really bad, yeah, because I'd just have, you know, I'd have 52 of these objects pasted into some file somewhere. It wouldn't be very useful, yeah? So if you want to use proper object-oriented JavaScript, you should use classes. Objects you can use in other ways for storing data and this kind of stuff. Classes support inheritance. They have constructors. Um, and I'm going to cover that in a later, later lecture. Last thing I want to talk about today um, is JavaScript object notation, um, commonly known as JSON. Um, so I've explained how you create objects in JavaScript. We've got like John equals, you know, this kind of stuff. We've built the object, the data structure within the program. And we can also convert that object into a string. And that really just involves putting double quotation marks around each of the keys. Um, and then the rest is, treat is unchanged, yeah? And that's called JavaScript object notation. So it's a very popular way now to exchange and store data. So XML, 10, 15 years ago, was the, you know, the language for representing data and exchanging data. But XML is verbose. It's like got lots and lots of stuff in it. It's also quite complicated to pass. You have you know, SACS passing and DOM passing, this kind of stuff. It's not great, yeah? Um, so pretty much everyone these days has moved over to JavaScript object notation as a way of storing data, representing data, exchanging it. Any, pretty much all web services are written in JSON. Uh, you know, because it's so easy and so compact and so so convenient for converting to and from JavaScript and other programming languages. So, um, if we have an object defined in JavaScript like that, um, the JSON representation of, this, of the object is, is this, yeah? So this is like a string, JSON's a string, so we've got the quotation marks on the outside of it here, and then each of the properties has a quotation mark around it, yeah? And then the rest is just the same, yeah? So, What's nice when you're working with JSON and JavaScript is it's very easy to convert between the two, yeah? If you've got a JavaScript object and you want to get the string JSON representation out of it, we call json.stringify. So here we've got JSON, John, uh, here's, the, here's the object. And then the string version, we're just calling JSON stringify and John, and that returns a string version of that object. And then we can, if we output that, we see that this is in JSON representation now. And as I said, there's many, you know, even using databases and all kinds of places, yeah? And we can go the other way, yeah? Once we've got something in JSON representation, we can go back into a JavaScript object um, just by calling json.pass on the string. 
and that will convert it back into a JavaScript object. And once it's a JavaScript object, we can access the properties such as name, yeah? Okay, so let's let's uh, do a quick demo. Okay, so let's let's stick with uh, let's let's uh, okay name age uh, fifteen or something old cat yeah um, okay so let's stick with a couple of simple properties. Okay, so there's my cat right um, now. If I want to, uh, if I do let's. Cat string, so converted to JSON string, I just call JSON dot stringify uh, cat uh, console dot log cat string. Uh, okay, so let's just check that out. So here's the cat. Here's the JSON representation. All this changes the quotation marks around the um, around the around the the keys. Yeah. And we can also do the other way. Um, let's suppose let's do the let's create a cat and cat and create the cat string here, right? Um, and put it all in quotation marks instead. So I'm creating from scratch a bit of JSON here. And because it's a string, we need to put quotation around it. Oh, come on. So now that's a string, right? That's just probably easier to see where I've messed up. Uh, I probably used to be in the same line or something. That's what's confusing here. Okay, so that's a that's a string, right? Um, Java. So if I try and do uh, console log uh, cat string dot name, for example, yeah, I'm hoping that will end up as being undefined. Uh, uh, right. Yeah. Uh, let's just get rid of that. Yeah, so we've got undefined. Yeah, let's just uh, make it clearer. Yeah, so we've got cat string here, which is just a JSON string. If we just try cat string dot name, I'm trying to access a property on cat string that doesn't exist because cat string is just a string. Yeah. So if we go back here, and then we convert the string back into into a JavaScript object. So we do JSON dot pass. Which will convert the string back into a JavaScript object, um, and then we can copy that. Ah, bother. Okay, and get rid of that. Okay, so now, if we convert the string back into a JavaScript object, we can then access name on the JavaScript object. Yeah. So now it's called Ginger. So it's undefined here because cat string is just a string. The JavaScript doesn't look inside this string at all. But once we've converted it back into a JavaScript object, we can then access properties like name or age or that kind of thing. And that's why we're getting ginger here, yeah? So in course at one, it's requirement that you store user data and scores in JSON format. So the sort of approach um, I imagine you're gonna take, at least the sensible approach, is at the registration stage, we're gonna have some kind of create this data structure and maybe an array and add objects representing the different uh, the users, one or more users that have registered. To store it, um, because in local storage we have to store in a string, and as you come to MongoDB it's, you know, it's all stored in string. Well, you can store it in objects, but let's, let's ignore that for a moment. Um, treat it as strings. So to store it, um, at least in the coursework one, we're converting it into, uh, we need to convert it into a string so we can put it in local storage. So we're going to use JSON stringify to convert users into a string representation of those users, yeah? So it's no longer an object, becomes a string, and then we can put it into local storage. But at a later point in time, we might want to access the data in local storage as a JavaScript object so we can add more data to it or extract the scores, this kind of stuff. So then we're going to do json.pass to get the to convert the string back into um, a JavaScript object. And then we can add more data to it, that kind of stuff. And again, then we can stringify it and store it again if we want to, yeah? So the general process is you manipulate the data as a JavaScript object, store it as a string, sorry, convert it into a string and store it in a string. And then you take that string, convert it back into a JavaScript object, manipulate it again, then store it again as a string, yeah? In coursework two, you're gonna be using MongoDB. And that's entirely based on JSON. So JSON's extremely, you know, that's part of the reason I had this JSON-based coursework one, so that you can be ready for MongoDB and ready for building web services and stuff. As well, because in coursework two and coursework three, you're gonna be using Ajax, which is a way in which JavaScript can talk to the server 
and typical way in which you exchange data between client and servers is again JSON because it's just such a convenient, compact and efficient format, yeah? So you'll get to love JSON, but it'll just take a little while to get used to it, yeah? So the modern JavaScript tutorials, got some nice tutorials on this kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, if you look up um, here, if you look up, you know, Array, for example, um, it's got a whole sort of nice, you know, explanation of how you use arrays. Or if you look up uh, objects, um, again, it's got a whole section on JavaScript objects, some really nice diagrams. I really rather like this tutorial. And um, what else we got? Um, yeah, it's also got, I'm sure it's got a section on JSON, yeah? So there we go. So explaining all this to string method and stringify and this kind of thing, yeah? So eloquent JavaScript. Uh, I'm less familiar with that. I've used it less, but it's also got, you know, as you can see, uh, stuff on data structures, objects, and arrays, and no doubt there's some stuff on JSON in there as well. So possibly this is another way in which you can access similar information. Okay, so this lecture has introduced you to JavaScript arrays and objects, and I've also covered uh, JavaScript object notation.